If you are ever lucky enough, and I do mean lucky enough, to become conscious and lucid within a nightmare, don't wake up. Every time you wake yourself from a nightmare, the unintegrated trauma that led to the creation of the nightmare remains unintegrated. That's why your nightmares recur. Surely you've wondered that. So first of all, let's start with the basics. What is a lucid dream? A lucid dream is a dream in which you're actively aware of the fact you're dreaming as the dream is happening. So it's not just a really vivid dream. It's not a dream where you see future events and those future events come to pass. And it's not an out of body experience uh, where your consciousness shifts out of the body. It's specifically a dream where you're sound asleep, but while you're sleeping and dreaming, you go, aha, this is all a dream. That's what makes it a lucid dream. It may well be vivid. It may well see future events. It may well lead to an out-of-body experience. But by definition, a lucid dream is simply a dream where you go, aha, I'm dreaming as the dream is happening. Now, lucid dreaming doesn't happen in that in-between state. It's not a hypnagogic phenomenon. It's not a shamanic journey. It's not a yoga nidra. Although yoga nidra, shamanic journeying, all these things can help with lucid dreaming. Lucid dreaming actually happens in REM dreaming sleep, which comes at the end of your 90 minute sleep cycle. So you are totally asleep when you have a lucid dream. If you ever wondered what a lucid dreamer looks like when they're having a lucid dream, they look like this. They're totally out for the count. So you're not half awake, half asleep. You are dreaming. But in the dream, you become actively aware of the fact you're dreaming. The reason I labor that point is because we have a problem with the term. The term lucid dreaming doesn't really connote the definition of what it is because lucid means something that's clear, something that has clarity. And just because the dream's clear doesn't mean it's lucid. So possibly a better term would be conscious dreaming, because that's what makes it lucid, when you're conscious within the dream. Now, I can't see you guys go on webinar function, but maybe you can hit the, uh, the hand button. Who here has had a lucid dream? Um, who here has ever had a dream where in the dream you've gone, aha, I'm dreaming? Okay, I'm seeing loads of yeses come through. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Whee, I love this. About a gazillion yeses, okay. So for those who haven't hit yes, or are still hitting yes, have you ever had a nightmare where in that nightmare, you've gone, I've got to wake up, I've got to wake up. If you've ever had that experience, that was also a lucid dream. Because the moment you acknowledged there was a place to wake up to, you acknowledged you were dreaming. So a little footnote on this, because this is a different talk, my nightmare talk. If you are ever lucky enough, and I do mean lucky enough, to become conscious and lucid within a nightmare, don't wake up. Every time you wake yourself from a nightmare, the unintegrated trauma that led to the creation of the nightmare remains unintegrated. That's why your nightmares recur. Surely you've wondered that. Why don't my happy dreams recur? Why doesn't that dream where I'm having a dinner date with Tom Hardy or whoever your favorite you know, Hollywood star is, why have I never had that dream more than once? But why do I have that nightmare every week or every month or whenever it is? Because nightmares, every nightmare we wake from, Every nightmare we reject, every nightmare we see as something bad has to come back. Nightmares aren't there to punish us. They're there to integrate our shadow. So if you do ever become lucid within a nightmare, stay in the nightmare for as long as you can. Because as the great Krishnamurti said, the seeing is the doing. Just to remain in a nightmare knowing I'm not really in danger, I'm simply dreaming about danger or dreaming about trauma can be enough to unravel trauma in just one lucid dream. The reason I'm really into this at the moment is because this is what my new book's about. I spent the last few years working with veterans from the armed forces, um, from Afghanistan, Iraq, etc., and our, our previous wars too, who are coming back with really bad nightmares. And what we found is that lucid dreaming can be a really powerful tool to help integrate those nightmares. Footnote over, back to the main talk. So, a lucid dream is a dream where you know you're dreaming as the dream is happening. Once that happens, you can control, although I'll be careful with that word, direct and choreograph the dream at will. So once you know that you're dreaming, you gain access to the world's most powerful virtual reality simulation, your own subconscious mind. In a lucid dream, you are inside your own psyche. You are literally walking around a three-dimensional projection of your own mind. And you can choose what to do. Now, if that sounds psychedelic, it should. 
you know, there's a renaissance in psychedelic experience now, psychedelic therapy and all this stuff. And some of it's really, really great. But if you want a free psychedelic experience where you don't need to, you know, go and see a shaman in, in, uh, in the Amazon, or you don't need to find some dude on the street, you can go into your own mind in bed. Because in the lucid dream, you have access to this huge psychedelic experience. So once we're lucid, we know that we're dreaming, we can choose what to do. So let's say you want to fly through the sky. Most people will go, Hoom. well, most people. I'm a Superman flyer. And um, again, we can have a yes in the chat box here. Usually three main types of flyer in their lucid dreams. Who's a Superman flyer? Who flies like this? Any yeses for that? Second type is the swim, here we go. Second type is the swim flyer. They don't fly like that in their dreams. Quite a few people. Ah, oh, there we go. And the third main type of flyer in the dreams is the bouncer, who kind of like get a bit of gravity and then get a bit of gravity. Okay. Oh, the swimmer, we got bouncers coming through. Okay, cool. So in the lucid dream, let's say I want to fly. Put my hand up like Superman and I fly. Now, you might think that that means I'm controlling the dream. Well, I may be controlling my subjective experience. I'm controlling how fast I fly. I'm controlling left, controlling going right. But to say we're controlling the dream is actually to underestimate the power of the subconscious mind. Because although we may be controlling our subjective experience, what is controlling the trees that I'm flying over? What is controlling the people walking in and out of the shops if I'm flying over a scene of London? What is controlling the wind on my face as I fly through? I'm not choosing for that to happen. So although I may be controlling my subjective experience, the vast majority of the dream is not under our control. So lucid dreaming is not about dream control. It's actually about making friends with the subconscious mind. And that's why it's such a powerful tool for psychological integration. No sailor controls the sea. Think how arrogant a sailor would be to say, I control the ocean. And yet, a sailor can sail as if they were in control. Why? Because they have such respect for the ocean, such knowledge of the tides, of the stars guiding them, of the coral reefs, of where the sea monsters lie, that they can sail as if they were in control. That's the same with lucid dreaming. Just as it would be an arrogant sailor to believe they control the dream, uh, to control the sea, I believe it's an arrogant lucid dreamer who believes they control the dream. So we don't want to control it, we want to befriend it. But if you make friends with the subconscious mind, you are making friends with 95% of your potential. I'm sure you've heard that old adage, the uh, post Jungians use of the, uh, the iceberg of consciousness, right? Above the surface of the top 10%, the conscious mind, that which we're aware of, that which we can see. Below the surface, the iceberg, the vast majority, 90%, the unconscious mind, that, that which we can't see. In a lucid dream, you are taking that top 10% of your consciousness and flipping it downward into that 90% of our fullest potential. Now, that might sound a bit like hypnotherapy, and again, it should. If we only had 30 seconds left, you know, if this were the elevator pitch, for want of a better term, if I was giving you the elevator pitch for lucid dreaming, I'd say anything you can treat through hypnotherapy, you can also treat through lucid dreaming. So working with trauma, as I've mentioned before, working with negative thought programming, working with life manifestation, working with life skills rehearsal, working for confidence boosting, but also just like hypno hypnosis can be used for a stage show, also lucid dreaming can just be loads of fun. I taught myself to lucid dream when I was 16 years old. Um, I'd had some lucid dreams before when I was like 11, 12, but 16 was when I bought the books and kind of taught myself how to do it. So at 16 years old, before I got into Buddhism, before I ended up living in a Buddhist center for eight years with the monks and nuns, I taught myself to lucid dream. Now at 16 years old, when I gained access to the world's most powerful virtual reality simulation, where the rules of society didn't apply, you can imagine what I got up to. Yes, a lot of sex and a lot of skateboarding. At 16, those were like two of my favorite things. I'm not sure how much has changed. Um, I did get very good at skateboarding though, so the practice thing seemed, seemed to work. The other thing, not so much. So you can, of course, just use, just use lucid dreaming for fun. And that's totally fine. You know, if you get lucid tonight, and by the way, your chances of getting lucid tonight have just skyrocketed because you're listening to me talk about it. You're listening to somebody say it's possible. And in a minute, you're going to hear me give you the science that shows it's possible. If you do get lucid tonight, and maybe you do just want to fly about in your first lucid dream, have sex with a movie star, do some skateboarding, whatever you like. But once you've done that, I want to open you up to the huge potential for both spiritual and psychological growth that lucid dreaming holds. It's a funny story to end, to just to finish on that 16 year old story. 
I got into Buddhism when I was about 18, 19 years old. And when I got into Tibetan Buddhism, they had this thing called dream yoga. I kept hearing this term. I said, what is dream yoga? And this monk that I asked, he said, oh, dream yoga is the Tibetan Buddhist spiritual practice of lucid dreaming. And I was like, oh, lucid dreaming, I, I do that. <laughs> and he went, oh, uh, okay. Well, yeah, we, we've been doing it in Tibetan Buddhism for like a thousand years. And I said, really, lucid dreaming, you guys do that? Well, what do you use lucid dreaming for? And he said, we use it to do our spiritual practice while we sleep. We use it to explore the nature of reality. And we use it to prepare for the death and dying states. That was this penny drop moment. Whereas this kid who just used lucid dreaming for sex and skateboarding, I suddenly realized, wow, I've had the keys to something very powerful, but had never opened the lock. And then embarrassing, the monk said to me, so you can lucid dream? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I can lucid dream. He said in front of everyone, so what do you do in your lucid dreams? And I was so embarrassed. I was like, um, like skateboarding, like a lot of skateboarding. <laughs> So let's look at the science of lucid dreaming before we have a little time for questions. Okay, I've got half a brain here, my demonstration is. Okay, first off, lucid dreaming is a verified phenomena of REM dreaming sleep. Anyone listening now who doesn't believe that, just Google it, guys. All the research is out there. Maybe you meet someone after this talk who says, oh, lucid dreaming is bullshit, man. I don't believe that stuff. Absolutely wrong. 1975 at Hull University in the United Kingdom, lucid dreaming was first verified as a scientific fact. Of course, people had known that lucid dreaming had been around for thousands of years. In the Buddhist tradition, a thousand years. Um, in the Toltec Mexica tradition of the uh, shamanic Mexicans, it had been around for a thousand years. In the Sufi tradition of Islam, it had been around for 500 years. So people knew lucid dreaming existed. But before 1975, lucid dreaming was viewed as a paradoxical impossibility. They said there was no way you could be both conscious and asleep at the same time. They believed that consciousness was predicated upon your eyes open being awake. We now know that just isn't true. When you're having non-lucid dreams, like 99% of our dreams are non-lucid, right? Until we've done the training. The back part of the brain is highly activated. Visual cortex, brain stem, acetabulum. below. Front part of the brain, prefrontal cortex, very little activation in non-lucid dreams. Now, the scientists believe that your prefrontal cortex is where your sense of self resides, or at least the neural networks that create our sense of self reside. So the Charlie program, the like me, my eye program is around here. And in a non-lucid dream, this area gets very little blood flow, which is why I can dream I'm other people. I can dream I'm a child when I'm a man, uh, when I'm an adult. I can dream I'm a woman when I'm a man. I can dream I'm an animal when I'm a human. I mean, you've had crazy dreams, you're other people, right? Where you live in different places, which uh, doesn't seem to be you. That's because your sense of self can become very flexible in the dream state because the prefrontal cortex is switched off. Um, the last study was a 2018 study that I was part of. Now I'm really into martial arts, like 15 years of martial arts. I've got a black belt in kickboxing, used to uh, fight competitively, love it. And I love lucid dreaming. So this a research study came up where they needed people who were good at lucid dreaming and who loved martial arts. So I was like, brilliant, I'm gonna be part of this. They had us go into the lucid dream state and practice a kick sequence uh, that you, know, you found difficult to do in the waking state. A small research team, so there were only kind of 20 participants or something. Of those 20 participants, 81.3% who practiced their martial arts in their lucid dreams reported marked waking state improvement. 81.3% of the martial artists got better by training in their lucid dreams. Now here's the confession. Myself, embarrassingly, the dude who was supposed to be the expert in the study, I didn't get any better. <laughs> I didn't get any worse, but I didn't get any better, but I had to be truthful. You know, I tried it in the dreams and I just didn't get any better at kicking the waking state. So maybe I did it wrong, but 81.3% got better. So you might be thinking, okay, well that's cool. So I can rewire my brain in the lucid dream, but I'm not into martial arts and I don't care about squats. My booty looks good already. Okay, well, let's apply this to everything else. Imagine if you go into the lucid dream and you practice kindness. Imagine if you go into the lucid dream and you practice integrating childhood trauma. Imagine if you go into the lucid dream and you ask questions that unlock your innate capacity to manifest in this life. What if you go into the lucid dream and you meet your inner artist and ask them questions? What if you go into the lucid dream and you practice being the person you know you could be? If you could only move beyond the barriers of fear that prevent you being that person right now. If you could do that, 
you could literally change your life while you sleep. However, it seems that in the lucid dream state, because you are in a 100% visualization, as I mentioned before, because you can't get more of a visualization than the lucid dream. If you apply visualized healing techniques within the lucid dream, it seems to have a very powerful effect. Now you might say, oh, it's just a placebo. Okay, but anyone who says just before the term placebo does not understand the placebo. The placebo is not just the placebo, it should be, wow, the placebo. So it seems like because the placebo is the mind affecting the body, if you engage the placebo effect plus visualize healing within a mind created reality of the lucid dream, they work together in a very powerful way. In the lucid dream, you're going down with the unconscious mind and planting these suggestions of healing intent. Those can work at a very powerful level psychologically. You can work with trauma, you can work with phobias, um, you can work in the same way as kind of family constellations. You can go into the lucid dream and create a constellation of the dream characters within, within your mind. Let's start with the phobia one, a nice example of this. I was totally with you guys. And even now, right, if you throw a spider at me, I'm getting the hell out of the way. But if a spider were to, you know, walk across my apartment floor now, I could pick it up and I could take it outside to my balcony. Ten years ago, no way could I have done that, man. I was, I would have kind of had to get someone else to deal with it. I was a full-on arachnophobe, probably inherited from my mom because I can't think of any trauma that actually led to it for myself. I was scared of spiders. And I'd heard this research that in a similar way to cognitive behavioral therapy, lucid dreaming can be used as a form of exposure therapy. Because remember, the lucid dream feels as real as this. It's an incredibly hyper-realistic virtual reality simulation within your own mind where the brain doesn't think you're dreaming, the brain thinks you're awake. So it can be used as a form of exposure therapy, let's say for those who are scared of spiders. So tonight, if you get lucid, number one tip, don't do this. When you're lucid, okay, I'm dreaming, I'm dreaming, don't go, spiders, now, as one of my students once did, and they promised me that every time I tell this story, I will tell people never to do that. Because as soon as they said spiders now, they were like everything that wasn't inanimate turned into a spider all the people turned into spiders, the things turned into spiders, the dream was full of spiders, so don't do that. But what you could do, you know, oh, I'm dreaming, I'm dreaming. So my body is asleep in bed, I'm in my mind. And remember, in a lucid dream, you have full, you know, you're, you're clear. You know, when I open my palm, there will be a small spider within it. And in the lucid dream state, just like in life actually, but it's more, it seems to be more difficult in life, thought manifests form. So if you have the thought that there will be a spider there, often that will manifest. Then in the dream, you could, okay, I haven't got a spider, but I've got a little Buddha. I'm going to imagine this little Buddha is a spider. You pick up the little Buddha spider, and it will feel real, by the way. You will feel the hair on its legs. You will, it, it's so realistic, the lucid dream. It's nuts. And it'll be crawling up your arm. And you'll be like, okay, oh, the spider's crawling up my arm. And you will be frightened, but just remind yourself, the spider does not exist. The arm does not exist. My body is safe asleep in my bed. That's what you need to tell yourself. This is just a virtual reality simulation of my own mind. You could allow the spider to crawl up your arm. Now, your brain doesn't know that, remember. The brain thinks you're awake. So the brain's going, uh, there is no spoon. Absolutely, whoever just said, oh, butterscotch, cool. Yes, um, totally. There is no spoon, dude. There is no spoon. Matrix reference, brilliant. So you can allow the spider to crawl up your arm. The brain thinks the spider's real and that you're awake. So it starts creating neural pathways saying, okay, I'm not freaking out anymore. I'm, I'm cool with spiders. Allow it to crawl up your arm. You can even befriend the spider. You can give it a name, whatever you like. That will have a deep and profound effect on your fear of spiders. Just by doing that, basically fearlessly interacting with, with that which you were afraid of within the lucid dream. That's the kind of, you know, that's, that's the slogan here. Again, it's worth a shot. Why not? There's nothing to lose. Use your lucid dream state for your spiritual practice and really your life can change. I see you there, Jason. I just finished up with this last one. So we're asleep for a third of our lives. About 30 years if you get eight hours sleep at night, right? Imagine if you could make use of those 30 years to wake up while you sleep. Imagine if you could use those 30 years of your life to meditate deeply, to explore the nature of reality, to power your mind up to such an extent that it directly affects the two thirds of your life that you're awake. And it does. If lucid dreaming only affected the third of our life we spend asleep, what's the big deal? But here's the cool thing. Whatever you do in the lucid dream profoundly affects the two thirds of your life that you spend awake. 
It is one of the most powerful tools for life manifestation I have ever come across.